Hello, can you all hear me? Good. Good evening to everyone and welcome to our seminar tonight on uh, trees. Everything you want to know about trees or is that your topic, Mark? We'll introduce Mark in just a minute. Uh, I'm Shirley Decker and I'm the director of Roots and Branches and Jenny who greeted you at the door is my executive assistant and she will be introducing Mark in just a minute, but I want to take a minute to, first of all, introduce a couple of board members that are here. Mike Faulkner back there in the kind of turquoisey shirt. Can you see Mike? He's the president of our board. And uh, we have Amy Grinna, who is somewhere over here. There's Amy, and she's on our board. And then we have uh, Susan Steinhoffel in the back row there. And Susan is the chair of our seminars this year. So you can look to Susan for a really good year of seminars. And we thank you, Susan, for all that that you've been doing. Thank you. Um, I also want to mention that we have a sponsor, thanks to Susan, who works very hard at her job of, of uh, keeping our seminars afloat here. We have a sponsor, Johnson Nurseries, and we thank Johnson Nurseries for that. Um, and I, I personally just want to take a minute, and by the way, we got started just a couple minutes late because we were going by computer time. And that just set a little bit fast, about five minutes fast. So anyway, I just will take a minute here, not even a minute, to tell you a couple of quick things about roots and branches, because I don't know how many of you really know very much about us, although I met a lot of familiar faces coming in tonight. Um, roots and branches, uh, our mission is to improve the environment in our community. And we do this through all of our programs that we have year round. And at your chair, besides some of Mark's good information, there is um, a brochure, and this is why I don't have to talk very long, because it'll tell you everything you need to know about our organization. Plus, the most important thing is inside, there's a calendar of events. And you'll be able to see uh, the upcoming seminars that are always free and open to the public and other things. And this is where I really like to put in a little pitch here. Um, we have a lot of activities and you may be interested in doing more things with us besides the seminars. Uh, we have a cleanup campaign coming up on May 4th. That's one way that we help improve the environment in our community. And uh, we have other things, our adopt -a plots in the downtown area and around town. And there are always lots of opportunities for volunteers and we get sometimes many volunteers from people who just get introduced by the seminars, but then they do other things with us as well. So check out these um, events in, in the calendar of events uh, at your chair there. And I think that's all I need to say to you for now, but Jenny is going to introduce our speaker and a couple of housekeeping things. Thank you. Hi, good evening. I'm Jenny Conley, as Shirley said. Um, I greeted most of you at the door. Thank you so much for coming. I'm going to be very brief. Uh, I'm just going to be passing around a couple clipboards. One is going to be a pre-sign up for our next seminar, which is uh, the Monarch Migration and Favorite Plants of the Monarch. Um, it's going to be a very interactive video uh, heavy presentation, um, so it's a good one to sign up for early. I have a funny feeling that we might reach capacity on that one. Um, then also we'll pass around a clipboard and we would like suggestions of things you'd like to hear about in the future. Um, Susan will take those topics and look for speakers to bring things in that you want to hear about. And going forward, we'll introduce Mark. Uh, Mark is a forester with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. He manages the state-owned forests in Washington and Ozaki counties and assists uh, private landowners manage their forest land in multiple counties. So welcome, Mark. All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. See if we can get my slideshow up here. <laughs> the expert, super. Oh, you got it going. You already know what you're doing. We're working on it. <laughs> Perfect. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, no problem. Uh, where are we at here? Well, whoops. 
really screwing stuff up. I'm uh, trying to get back to the first slide here. Did you get it? No, we want to get to the that. So. Try yeah. Technology, everybody. Oh, I think we're running a couple of them. Maybe I think that up. that's what happened. Yeah. Okay. There you go. There. Now we're off on the right foot. So. Super, thank you for bearing with me. Again, my name is Mark Sass. Uh, as you can see on, uh, on the screens here, so I was the forester out of the Pike Lake office for, uh, it was about a year. Prior to that, I was in Adams County as their public lands forester there for about five years. So um, moved, just moved back to the area, spent about a year here. Um, and as you can see, I have ultimately changed positions in the last couple of months. So. Uh, now I'm not technically involved hands-on in forestry at all. So, uh, but we had this on the calendar, something uh, uh, happily jump in and, and fulfill. Uh, but now my role were, is working with fire departments and prescribed burning and everything like that in the southeast corner of the state. So still DNR, still Department of Forestry, uh, just a little slightly different role. So uh, I did work landscaping through high school and college uh, as, a, as a summer job. Um, something to do there. I'm a couple classes away from an urban forestry minor in college. I, my major, major was forest management. I had minors in soil recreation and uh, soil science and forest recreation were my minors. So I took quite a few urban classes, but with the DNR, um, our, where we help private landowners, we require, we're looking at forests, groups of trees, collections, um, our minimum is 10 acres. So I come at this with a little bit different angle than most of you who uh, might be looking, you're looking at individual trees and how this one tree means a lot to you. Um, my experience in my career has been looking at acreage, 10, 20, 1,000 acres at a time and moving on up. So a little bit different angle, but uh, I think a lot of the stuff when it comes to planting and tree care, uh, very similar in large size or, or smaller quantities. So. Uh, with a group this large, we'll try to hold questions till the end, if that's all right. Uh, pretty laid back presentation style, um, but just with so many folks, we'll try to hold them to the end and try to have enough time to answer everything for you. So right off the bat, um, the biggest mistake that folks make with when they get trees is, is most of them are planted incorrectly. So uh, you get that tree, whether it be bald and burlap, whether it be potted from the parking lot of Shopco or Johnson's Nursery or whoever it might be, you dig a hole, you come home, you stick it in the ground. The issue is on those bald and burlap or potted plants, um, since they're resizing them, they are in that container, uh, whether that be burlap or, or the pail, uh, they're in that con container too deep as they took them out of the ground and put them in there. So the biggest thing um, is looking at the the slideshow here, we want to make sure that root flare is at the ground level. If we put that tree in too deep, things look great for the first 5, 10, maybe 20 years, but eventually we're looking at that middle picture that's called stem girdling roots. So as that tree was in that container or in that uh, ball and burlap, those roots got really tight around there and if you don't if you don't have that tree high enough out, those roots continue to grow and as the trunk of the tree grows, it ultimately ends up choking your tree from underneath. Uh, the worst part about it is you have no idea about it until you're at year 10, year 20, somewhere down the road. Uh, first house in Adams County, every single tree that the previous owner had planted looked like that. They're all planted too deep. Um, Luckily, we sold the house soon enough before they all died. I knew what was going to happen, and we moved back here. But uh, it's super common. If, if we're not paying attention and looking at it, that's what happens. So uh, one of the pictures in the, in the top right there, that's what we're looking for when we plant. We want to see that root collar, that root flare, up and at the soil line or just above. Um, trees that grow naturally, as you're walking in the woods, things like that, you're going to see that tree taper out and meet the ground with its roots. That's a really strong base. That's exactly how those, those roots should be planted and not straight down the, the bowl of the tree or the trunk of the tree and you don't see that root flare at all. That means you're going to have problems down the line. Um, and when you're digging your hole, that's 
what we want to do is we want to go significantly wider. They say three times wider than the pot or the uh, container in the roots. You want to go three times wider than that with your hole and just about the depth of what you need. You go a lot wider to break up that soil, to aerate that soil, and allow that tree to the, the roots to then expand. You're going to break up that root ball when you put it in the ground. Make sure it doesn't have the start of any stem girdling roots in the pot or in the ball. Take the burlap completely off. You're going to take uh, the wire cage completely off, everything like that. Break up that root ball, allowing those roots to go without any hesitation or anything stopping them that way. Uh, when we fill that hole back in, we're going to pack, make sure it's packed down. We don't need to pack it down or compact it, anything like that. Just make sure it's sturdy enough that it's when it does get rained on or it does get wet and you water it, it's not going to move or shift too much, um, but nice and sturdy and steady that it's not going to go anywhere for you. So, uh, mulching, when, when we do put a new tree in the ground, uh, mulching can do great things for it. It's even better if you do the mulching correctly. So uh, a lot of the times in, in landscaping, we see a lot of people that were out there every year, every other year, putting brand new mulch on um, because we want, we want it to look fresh and we want it to have that nice color and everything like that. That is exactly why I don't allow my wife to have any mulch at her house because one, I hate mulching, and two, re putting mulch on year after year, really not good for what we're doing for those trees. Mulch should be uh, anywhere from two to four inches thick uh, four inches if you're on drier, sandier soils that are a little more droughty, you're trying to hold a little bit more moisture in that soil. And two inches on most of the soil around here where we have enough clay and we have good water holding capacity. Anything more than that four inches or two inches, we start to hold too much water in, in the mulch and in the soil underneath and we can start to get problems with uh, root rot or other fungal or wet diseases just because we're holding too much water on the site. The other thing, uh, soil for any sort of plant, especially trees, uh, it, when you take a cross section of it, it should be 50% soil, 25% air gaps and pockets, and 25% available water for them. So if we mulch too heavily, <clears throat> excuse me, if we mulch too heavily, we're taking too much of that air out of the soil. So those roots are going to, they like to lie within that top five, six inch cross section of the soil. If, we, if you stick eight inches of mulch on there after two or three years and seasons of doing that, those roots are, one, they're gonna be stressed for moisture, and two, they're gonna be trying to work their way up to get as high in, as they can to get that air that they need. Um, if they're saturated or don't have that air, it's another stressor for the tree that you can start to see some decline in, in the health of the tree or, or decline in vigor. So some things we're looking at. Volcano mul mulching, how we mentioned there. Um, the, the, you can see the proper and the improper way to mulch. Uh, volcano mulching is where you'll see it, you bring it right up to the trunk of the tree and it looks like the, the mulch volcano just erupted a tree out of it. So again, putting all that mulch uh, right on the base of the tree, um, uh, just asking for fungal issues or um, those wet type of diseases to, to impact directly on that tree trunk and not just the roots, but now we're on the trunk itself. So ideally our mulch should be about three to six feet uh, outside of the trunk of that tree. That gives us enough room to uh, hold that moisture. Those small capillary uh, roots are going to be right there, especially when the tree is younger. And it keeps the biggest thing probably um, in a lawn setting like this is it keeps us away from it with a weed whacker and with a lawnmower. Uh, I, I can't tell you how many trees each year are killed um, as you're trying to get those last couple blades of grass before the 4th of July to make the lawn look nice and yet do some pretty nasty damage with your, with your string trimmer as you're um, chewing up the bark of your tree. So that is one of the main benefits, uh, especially in these yard settings where you have trees in the middle of your lawn. It keeps, the, um, keeps us from damaging our trees inadvertently while we're out there and working on things. So the other thing, kind of jumping into, into our next slide here, um, by having that little buffer of uh, mulch around, 
in the yard setting, we're not putting those fertilizer, fertilizers, those weed and feed type uh, Scott's Turf Builder on our lawns that have broadleaf killer built in. So they encourage the monocots or, or grasses to grow, um, but there's built in weed killer that'll target anything with a broad leaf. So um, your smaller trees, one you just planted that year, a couple years ago, they are susceptible to those, uh, those herbicides that we're putting on our lawn to keep our lawn healthy. It can be uh, a negative for, for those trees we just planted. So having that buffer of mulch around also helps to go that way. A uh, lot of folks like to put the tree in the ground, let's give it a head start, let's give it a jump, let's make sure we're, we're up and running. In uh, the soils that we have around here, for the vast majority of them, we're in pretty good shape for nutrient-wise and water capacity and everything like that. Everybody wants to have the biggest and the best and the fastest growing tree right off the bat. For that first year, let that tree, plant the tree, water it when you need to. The big thing is just letting that tree get acclimated, um, figuring out how it needs to put its roots down and make, make sure it's solidly rooted in the ground. We don't need a ton of, it doesn't need to grow a foot in the first year. I'm more concerned about it putting roots down, creating a strong and healthy base uh, for the years ahead. If you were one of those people, you have to do something, you have to touch it, uh, a 10-10-10 fertilizer, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, potassium, a basic 10-10-10 slow release fertilizer in most cases is just enough. If you're seeing issues or deficiencies or you think things aren't looking right with your tree, um, you can go through and get a soil test. Or you can work with um, a, a certified arborist who can test that soil and they can actually take plant tissue and test them to see if you are deficient in any one of those things. If that's the case, they can prescribe, if you will, uh, a different fertilizer to make sure we can make up those, those nutrients that were short. But in general, where we're at, and especially for the first few years, that tree will get acclimated on its own. It'll grow just fine. We don't necessarily need to start helping it along and pushing it too quickly. So um, that fertilizer, whatever you get, so obviously they're the, the spikes that you see, they're advertised pretty heavily. In this case, I just pulled a package from miracle Grow. Um, they're great. They do, they do good things, um, but also the the basic fertilizer 10, 10, 10 that you get at Fleet Farm or at Walmart or wherever you might go, um, ultimately they contain the same thing. So uh, the 10, 10, 10 is the, the chemical in there, the nutrients that they hold, they're the exact same when you, when you put them on the ground. So whether it's the spikes that you choose or read the label on the bag and maybe it's sprinkle a cup of this other fertilizer around, you're accomplishing the same thing. It's, it's whatever you feel best about doing. So uh, once we get that tree in the ground, looking at things to do to make sure that tree is straight and growing healthy and, and doing everything we need it to. In general, uh, I, I try to avoid staking as much as possible. We'll take extra care when we put that tree in the ground, make sure we have the soil around that tree and the root ball compacted enough that it is straight and it's solid and we're not gonna worry about it leaning or anything like that. Uh, in the case that we do have to um, either put a tube on it or stake it, we, uh, the tubes are great for smaller trees, obviously. You're, the, the big reason or the push for those is to keep animals off. Uh, I would recommend uh, anywhere from five to six feet. Six feet is the deer browse level. Deer will stand on their back legs. I'm sure most of you have seen it in your yards, unfortunately. They'll actually stand on their back legs um, and reach up. They were doing it on the crab apples in my backyard last night. I was watching them. So we recommend over six feet just to get it above the head of those deer. deer because they're going to be looking for those buds and looking for all um, the nutrients that they provide which is great for them, but it's not so great for our tree. So um, there is the, the issue of cost with our tree tubes. They run, um, and again, in, in a yard setting, they're not too bad. They're anywhere from two to $5 or up to $6, um, plus stakes and things like that. In a yard setting, 
we can handle that, that's, that's pretty easy. Um, in a forestry setting, like what I'm used to working with when we're planting 750 to 800 trees per acre, that's where we run into issues when you want to tube most of your trees to keep the deer off them, it gets a little pricey in a hurry. So um, at home, not so bad. If you have two or three tubes that you keep around and um, over the years you can rotate them around depending on how many trees you're planting, you're in good shape. The maintenance part of them, uh, what they do really well is they make a really nice little greenhouse inside of them. So during the growing season, it keeps the moisture from the tree nice and contained, and it actually keeps the inside of that tube a little bit warmer with the sun beating in, which creates a nice, warm, humid, humid environment to get that tree to grow really quickly, and it does a lot of great work for us. The issue is in the fall of the year and through the winter, uh, if we don't do anything, the buds can have a hard time, it's called hardening off for the winter. So if we leave that tree in the tube all the way late fall into early winter when we finally get that cold snap where it's 10, 15 degrees, sometimes if we don't do anything, those buds aren't hardened off enough that it shocks the tree and you'll see um, either buds not opening in the next spring or sometimes rarely um, complete mortality of the tree. So one thing to remember with using these tree tubes is once you get into the fall of the year, uh, September, October, November, go ahead and you know when you're when you're watching a Packer game and that's not going so well, um, turn it off, go outside and just go lift your tree, tree tubes up. Just pick them up uh, two, three inches, that's all you need. But th what that does is it circle, circulates that air up and through and breaks that greenhouse effect so those buds harden off well for you and it'll carry well through the winter. Um, in the spring, once we get to this point or a little later on when those trees are gonna start waking up and break dormancy, go ahead, slide those tubes back down and that'll get you going for that greenhouse effect again in the, in the upcoming spring. So just one little thing, if you're really close to the lake, most years we don't have a huge temperature swing. Uh, this year we still obviously had, had those extreme temperatures where we're gonna see big issues with this if, if we don't lift those tubes. So, um, like I said, when it comes to staking, that's your other option to make sure those trees are growing straight and growing well. Um, try to avoid it the best we can. As we plant that tree, make sure it's vertical and in the up, upright and locked position. Um, make sure we don't have any issues. However, uh, if you do need it, if you have it in a, a really windy spot, or a lot of times like you put one out by a bus stop and all the neighborhood kids are sitting there and pulling on it, things like that, that's when we're gonna see trees that are staked. So in the picture, um, you can see, uh, you'll see them occasionally with these uh, pegs or the ropes are going down to the ground and angle pulling to the ground. We'll try to avoid that. We want our stakes to be even across, not pulling that tree down or anything by, like that. Um, and we, want, we don't want our, our tubes or what we have holding those straps, we don't want them to be tight. We want that tree to have the ability to move. Um, trees have the ability to sense when there is swaying and moving, and that is what generates their growth response to put uh, diameter on the trunk. So if we limit the ability of that tree to sway slightly, it's not gonna signal the tree that it needs to put on more diameter growth on the trunk. And when you do take those, your supports off, you might have a beautiful crown up top and a very small trunk that can't support it when you do get that, that big wind or the thunderstorm or anything like that. So we want a little bit of play and a little bit of movement in um, that the trunk can still go on and move back and forth to create that tree that's gonna be healthier when we do take those off. At most, I wanna see a tree stake for two growing seasons. A lot of the times, usually if you, if you stake it for one, that's enough to get that tree anchored and settled in those roots all in a great spot to hold that tree. So in general, one is best and you can go two, but be cautious again. We want this tree to, we're just trying to get it straight and to get it settled in so it can grow vertically and safely in the, in the future. So um, then use when you're 
tying that tree or whatever you're using to lash that tree, um, you use something that spreads that surface area or that tension out. Don't use wire, baler twine, or anything like that. If you use something, I've seen garden hoses use, they make special, um, special tubing that you can buy um, at Fleet Farm or any of the, the garden stores for that too. But make sure it's got a nice wide surface area and you leave a little bit of play. We don't want to be biting in and girdling that tree where we have it uh, tied and locked up here. So I think the most important thing that, that I feel outside of, it's, it's between planting and pruning or where most folks go wrong with, with their trees at their house. So um, like I said, I took a lot of urban, I was a couple of classes away from getting an urban forestry uh, minor, and I'd say a good majority of those classes are all about pruning and individual tree care. So um, while I don't do it every day, it's something that they definitely hammer into you enough before you leave. So um, when it comes, a lot, lot of easy questions right off the bat, uh, when we get most of the time, nine times out of 10 or 95%, any of these trees want to be pruned in the dormant season. Fall, late fall, winter, somewhere in there. Um, there are a couple oddball shrubs and flowering, everything else um, that might want to be pruned. You can prune it early spring to promote flowering and things like that. In general, trees and shrubs would like to be pruned and they do best when they're pruned in the dormant season. That way you're not actively taking out their energy and their, and their power as they're growing, um, and it just makes life easier for them. So um, amount, how much can you take off at one time? Never take more than a third of that canopy, a third of the leaf cover off at one time. So it's, mm, it doesn't happen regularly. You see a, a third, of, third of that tree is a lot. Um, it can happen pretty quickly. So. My, you know, my folks, my, my dad planted trees a number of years ago and I'm trying to think about 18 years ago when we built our, their house. Um, I'll come home and he does a lot of things great. He doesn't prune his trees. Um, and so I'll go home and by the time I start pruning them, I have to be pretty cautious not to take that third of that canopy off um, between taking down uh, co-dominant leaders, which we'll talk about, things like that, it can add up pretty quickly as you're looking at how much branch structure you're taking off to try to get this tree, which uh, I guess leads us into the last bullet point I had here, schedule. You want, just like raising kids or raising a dog or anything like that, um, if you can get them on the right path when they're younger, it's going to make your job a lot easier um, as they get older. So I've got a dog that's four years old and a, a little girl that's three weeks old, so I'm hoping we take the path of, of the dog and we can start her young and life is good. But um, just like that, with trees, um, even pruning that first year, you're not too, that first year you plant, or if you plant in the spring, you can do some light pruning that first year. Um, that first five years is really important to get these trees, the branching structure that you want and be able to get it pointing up and in the right direction. So. Um, Technique, we'll get into, I, I've got a lot of pictures. I hope we can, you guys can see them and make them out from there. Um, I've also included, um, I think there's a piece of information on pruning in there as well. I really like the UW Extension stuff as, as a side note. I think they make some of the best, um, whether it be trees and forest health or a lot of their gardening stuff, they do a really, really good job. So if you have questions on tree health or planting or anything like that, UW Extension, I, I, I will sing their praises. I hand out a lot of their material. So um, just feel free to look that way if you do have questions coming up in the future. But um, as we look to prune trees and we're, we're looking for that branch bark ridge and the, the branch collar. So any of the, the screens around, trees um, do not, they cannot heal. But, there's no way that a tree can heal itself. All they know how to do is grow. So they compartmentalize decay and they ultimately eventually grow around whatever wound that they have. So we're trying to make the smallest wound possible and make the easiest wound for that tree to grow around in the near future. So we look for that branch bark ridge, which you can um, 
which you can see in that picture in the top right, they, they have it labeled there. You can also see it in the strong union versus weak union one, if you can make that out. It's going to be that ridge, that little bump of tissue where that branch meets um, the trunk of the tree or that main bowl. That's what we're looking for on the top. And on the bottom, it's called the branch collar. Um, so that's the little bit of swelling right underneath the bottom of the branch. And we're going to try to stay just outside or on that line between the branch bark ridge and the branch collar. Again, minimizing uh, surface area to get any infection in, and it speeds up that time for that tree to heal over. Excuse me, not heal over, grow over itself. So working with that is, is really important. If it's a smaller branch, usually you know under an inch, you can do it with a pruners. Uh, that's a one cut sort of thing, really easy. You can just go right to that spot and cut it as it, as it is. If it is a larger branch and you're working with a little hand saw or a larger saw or something like that, that's when we look to do, make sure we cut it in that three steps um, that you can see in that bottom picture there. So the first step's gonna be cutting, come, cutting up from underneath, probably varies six inches or so off of that, uh, that joint where you wanna make your final cut. Um, you wanna cut half to a third of the way through that branch, that prevents that branch from peeling. If you were just to cut anywhere on it, it'd take your main branch would come down, swing down, and take that bark off and do some damage to your tree. That first cut underneath prevents it from peeling that bark off as you go. Your second cut, you're just outside of it, you can take that entire limb off. Um, you're not going to have any issue uh, with, with doing that because you made your first cut and it's not going to peel that bark back. That then frees you up. Now you have a six inch stub or a foot long stub, whatever you left to make your final cut. You don't have the weight of that whole branch leaning on you. It's a lot easier. You can take your time and make sure you hit, uh, hit that angle correctly. So um, the other picture shows a, hand, a couple of cuts that are done incorrectly. So the first one, um, they left too big of a stub. So you've seen these walking around, just walking through the neighborhoods um, where they'll cut it six, eight, six inches off, four inches off. It just takes a long time for that tree to grow around it and it's just a longer time and a longer open wound for that tree um, to accept any disease or infection or anything like that. The other one is flush cut. That's honestly probably worse. Uh, what you did there is you cut straight into the, the bowl or the trunk of the tree. And again, now the compartmentalization factor that the tree had, if it was on, the wound is on the branch, it does a pretty good job of controlling anything coming in and close off. Um, different cellular stuff to make sure it's not coming in. Now we have a wound all the way into the trunk of the tree, into that bowl of the tree, and now it's more able to freely, fro freely flow up and down throughout the tree, causing more of a concern. So if you're going to err, um, I err on the side of leaving too much, um, but if we can do it just right, that's obviously the goal. So. Um, Lastly, we have uh, the strong union versus weak union. Um, these are things that we're going to look at when we're pruning. Those high angle uh, connections or joints, um, anything less than, say, 40 degrees, those are overall very weak joints for those trees. So when you see tr trees fail, that's, they're going to be failing at those joints that are really high angle. You're going to see them with multiple um, tops, things like that. That's where when the wind blows and twists those trees around, that's where they're gonna fail. So it's ideal, those are things that you're gonna look for in those first five years to 10 years to make sure you get those pruned back. Um, you want one dominant leader, one very top uh, branch that's going straight up. A lot of the times where you see these weak unions that are very close, um, you have trying to have two leaders or three leaders or multiple. So you can go in there and take off some of that co-dominant leader, that second one, um, to reduce the weight on that union and then make sure that tree still has the, the apical dominance, that main leader going up. And that just strengthens the tree and makes it look a lot nicer, you know, 30, 40, 50 years down the road as well. Um, they teach week-long classes on ide identifying hazard trees in um, parking, lot, uh, parking lots and campgrounds and all sorts of stuff. You guys can pretty well do that if you just start looking for these unions 
and any defects in the trees. That's all these classes are about. So as you walk, walk through your own backyards or, or forests or go to campgrounds or parks, things like that, you're, you're going to identify the trees that are gonna have health issues and lose branches and drop branches on cars when you park underneath them. You're gonna be able to do that just looking at those branch unions on which ones are gonna fail and which ones, um, those high angle ones, those 40 to 45 to 60 degree angles that are nice and strong and they're not gonna go anywhere. Uh, lastly, I had the bullet point about wound seal. In general, you have some people that swear by it and some people that don't. Um, I am one that doesn't. So as soon as you make that cut into a tree, it's open to whatever is flying around in the air. Um, as soon as you put that wound seal on, tree coat, whatever it might be, um, it's usually black in color and it completely seals that wound in. Or that wound in. Anything that was or could be a decay agent in there is now completely sealed into that tree. It is now covered in black and it is in a humid environment so it's going to be warmer, it's going to be moist and it's you're technically you could be making it worse for your tree by using that wound coat or that wound seal. So some people again they swear by it um, maybe oak wilt season I'm gonna I need to prune this tree in the the spring of the year, I'm gonna put tree coat on it to protect it from um, anything coming in, protect this from oak wilt. It's a horse apiece. If, if it makes you feel better, go for it. Um, but it, it's not necessarily gonna save the day and, and it's completely up to you. I'm personally not a believer in it, but there are a lot of folks, if you read different literature, they are. so up to you, I would shy away from it. So what to plant? I honestly can't stand up here and tell you the best trees for your location at your property um, and anything like that. There are honestly thousands and millions of different cultivars and crosses and hybrids and in my work as, as a DNR forester, we didn't look at any of them. So we were in the forest, they're, they're natively grown, we'll run into invasives, and that's honestly about it. Um, so I would definitely point you to anything that's native. Obviously it's proven that it can grow itself here. It has grown and evolved with the native pests and diseases that we have. Uh, in general, they do a lot better. So I will definitely point you in that direction. Example, Colorado blue spruce, you see them everywhere. They, they look great when they're younger. Colorado blue spruce, as the name might suggest, are not native to Wisconsin. So um, they look great for that first 20 years, and after 20 years, they actually become really susceptible to a lot of different um, d diseases and fungi. So we get a lot of phone calls that that 20 to 30 year old blue spruce, hey, my trees, they're losing all the needles on the lower branches. They're, they're really looking awful. What's going on? Well, and you list the three to five diseases that it can be. I, I can tell you off the bat it's going to be one of these, and there's nothing we can do about it at this point. So um, choosing those, those native trees, the white spruce, the things like that, they're, de they're going to do a little bit better for you just because they're here and they've evolved here. So uh, in the process right now, my grandpa planted a one acre lot 60 years ago we planted blue spruce all the way around it right now we're cutting them down one by one because they're nothing but toothpicks with a little bit of green on top so he's disappointed he was planning on dying before he had to cut them down and now he's still helping us drag brush so um, he's yeah he talked to him and he was he was anticipating they'd outlive him and he's not too happy anymore but um, Things, things to think about as you're planting trees is what kind of disease and issues they're, they're gonna come and um, take care of it in a couple of years. So the big thing for... Um, mm -hmm. Sure, so uh, native, native pines, we have white pine and red pine around here primarily. Um, otherwise, we, the spruces are white spruce and black spruce. So uh, Norway spruce actually does pretty well around here, but again, 
Norway, not Wisconsin. Um, it's not native, but it does very well on, on timber production. It actually does a pretty good job as a yard tree too. So that is an option um, that has kind of proven itself that it doesn't have take too much of a beating with the insects or diseases that we have here. So good question, yep. Um, as you're looking at yard trees and what to plant around your house, the big things are size and location. So yes, these white cedars look really good on the corner of your house right now when they're five feet tall or four feet tall. They act, accentuate it, make everything look bigger and it looks great. But what about in 30, 40 years when that white cedar is now 40 feet tall and is overgrowing and is touching your house and, and causing all sorts of damage to the siding and everything like that. So. Um, in areas like that close to your house where you just want something to be highlighted or shown or anything like that, a lot of the times shrubs are usually the better, op better option than trees. I'm not trying to talk you out of planting trees, but you need to be very cognizant of what, um, wh whatever you're planting is going to look like down the road and in the future. I, I hate seeing folks and they plant something that looks great and then 10 years later they're cutting it down because, whoa, I never thought it was going to be that big. So something to pay attention to and keep in mind. Yeah, so, uh, yep, pyramid, uh, I'll be honest, all of those arborvita, they have thousands of different varieties. I'm not, uh, I don't know too much about them. I would again direct you to um, Johnson's Nursery or somewhere like those where they've got the expert. They do make a lot of some of the, the more dwarf sized stuff that they, yep, this will only grow to eight feet. And those are the ideal things that you're going to put in, in smaller spaces. So I know there are great options out there that very well might be one. I just, I can't speak intelligently to it, unfortunately. So the other thing, so between size and location. So um, you can do a lot of great with heating and cooling your, your homes and things like that um, if you think and plan where you're going to put these trees. So um, evergreens and the spruces and the pines and things like that um, do really well on the north side of your house. They block the wind for you in the winter and do block the snow, everything like that. Um, when you put them on the south side of your house, they don't do so well because they block all that sun that's trying to come in. And that's why my driveway is covered with ice all throughout the winter is because my neighbor's got, he's got a couple of spruce trees right on the lot line that shade my driveway. So. Um, Thinking about where we're going to put conifers versus deciduous trees um, may make a big deal. Again, not necessarily right when you plant them, but looking that 20 years down the road when they're shading things or not. Um, same goes with the deciduous trees. Um, great shade, she shade trees. You put those on uh, the west side of your house um, and the south side of your house, and that'll help to cool your home in the summer, providing that shade and acting as a shade tree, not only for you sitting in the front yard or the backyard, but also for um, the house keeping that hot sun off of it. So things to think about as, as you're planting and going around and what does that, what does that look like in every season of the year um, and not just right now as we're, as we're looking at it. So lastly, invasive. So, we could talk for, for days and days and hours and hours about invasives. And um, the southeast of Wisconsin is unfortunately the home to everything we have. A um, lot, of, lot of people, a lot of travel, a lot of industry, everything seems to find a home here and start out here. So um, we have the buckthorn and the honeysuckle and the garlic mustard, and I'm, I'm sure you guys know a great deal about all of those. Um, that, that we have here currently. Some things that are up and coming that we're seeing uh, maybe not here yet or on the radar, um, the Asian longhorn beetle, if you've heard of that, and the picture of the beetle in the hand up there, um, that is right now found in New York and I believe Ohio and uh, there's one other state over there along with Ontario, Canada. Uh, but this little beetle it will, it will take on and make habitat and home in any hardwood tree. So um, as bad as 
Emerald Ash Borer and EAB was. Um, this option, it doesn't care if it's a maple or an oak or anything like that. Um, it'll make a home and, and do essentially the same thing as EAB. It's not as fatal. It usually starts in the branches, um, but it is, it is a pest that can do damage and kill a lot of these trees that we have as our hardwoods and that we otherwise seem pretty healthy and we don't have issues with. So um, doing everything we can in these areas to stop the spread of it. Again, moving firewood is a big thing. Um, just as everyday citizens like us, that's one of the easiest ways we can prevent and slow the spread of these things. So um, if you do see it, please, you know, report it. They kind of look like the pine sawyer beetle, um, which hard to tell these have kind of yellow spots the pine sawyer is going to have white spots and it's going to have one right between right in the center of the back right between uh, where the wings come together kind of between the shoulder blades if you will so that's one giveaway of the pine sawyer compared to the asian longhorn beetle but otherwise they they do look similar if you think you're seeing them report it if you can't take a picture and you can report that on the dnr website and we'll send somebody in forest health to confirm it or look at the pictures or whatever you got um, if the the bottom left um, there's a lot of these in yards everywhere everywhere you see out there it is um, a burning bush so general grow really well really pretty they great to have around um, some of the cultivars actually spread very readily in the wild i was down in the racine kenosha border helping a landowner they had seven acres and they've got honeysuckle and burning bush across all of it so I looked at it. I've never seen burning bush in the wild, if you will. I've never seen it in a forest setting. So I'm 99% sure I know what this is, but I had to go back and sent it to our forest health folks. And, is this what I think I'm seeing? I'm pretty sure. So there are a few cultivars that actually spread and, and will readily move into the woods and do that sort of a thing. So something to keep an eye on and make sure you talk to those folks at the nursery. Um, make sure they're they know what spreads and what doesn't. Um, there are specific cultivars that are out there and that are labeled that should and should not be sold anymore. So they can point you in the right direction with that. And the other two pictures up there, that's actually a, a mere cork tree. I don't know if you've heard of that one. Um, we thought it was brought over, beautiful looking tree, uh, grows really well, grows quickly. We didn't think, we, we thought we were too cold for it to reproduce. Um, but right now it is found in great numbers in Adams County and Columbia County and a lot of the other counties in the south, southern part of Wisconsin. So I actually set up a timber sale. This was the second most prominent tree on that 80 acre timber sale. It was oak and it was a mere cork tree. So it grows very quickly. We, some of them were 22 acres or so, in, or 22 inches in diameter and size. Um, grows really quickly. Uh, right out inside of that corky, rough bark, uh, you scrape that away, it's got a bright sulfur yellow cambium. So the issue is we can't sell it to anybody to get rid of it. Um, we had it in cords and cords and truckloads. Um, we can't sell it to paper companies because they wouldn't put it, wouldn't run it through with their paper because it would dye whole batches of paper yellow. Um, so right now we're looking at niche markets that it, you can mill it and kind of do the at-home stuff. It lo does look very neat with that sulfur yellow cambium when you plane it out. Um, but we're trying to find somebody that'll take it and, and buy it. And again, it came over as an ornamental. It looks great. Um, and now it's, it's a major issue in some of our forests. So just a couple of things that are coming up. There are a million things every day that get imported to, to the U.S. and any single one of them could, you know, be the next honeysuckle or buckthorn or anything like that. So um, be a little diligent. That's why I push so hard and heavy on um, all the native species, um, just because we know it's, it's not going to go anywhere. And if it does, it's already in the woods and we don't have to worry about it. So. So definitely appreciate the time, appreciate Ritz and Branches for inviting me again. A little bit different angle, myself working with large landowners and uh, many of you, 
you know, in your backyards or, or more urban properties. So I'm um, happy to come and speak and help out. Uh, I would direct you, if you do have forest land, anything like that, um, Wisconsin DNR, and if you search forest assist, forestry assistance locator, um, you get the DNR forester for your area as well as private consulting foresters that can help you on your forest land. And if you're looking for an expert on your individual tree or yard tree, anything like that, uh, Wisconsin Arborist Association has a really nice website right up on top. You click uh, find an ar or arborist for hire is what it's labeled um, and it'll put your zip code in and it'll direct you to all of any of the certified arborists that have gone through their classes and have decided they want to be on the website. So um, for tree work, things like that, we would definitely point you to the certified arborists for their help. Again, individual disease things on trees, they'll test them, they can run them through a lab and they'll let you know exactly what you have. So, appreciate your time. Uh, I believe we've... Do you have a question? Do you have a question? Yep, we can take a couple of questions quickly. I'll see how I can do for you. Yep. Perfect. Yep. So yeah. Yep. So yeah. If you heard her, she used a snow fence to keep the deer out. Um, I I know West Bend. I was just at your county deer advisory council meeting, which you and our foresters go to as well. Um, yeah. Urban urban deer in West Bend and the surrounding area, uh, big issue, big nuisance. So yeah, doing anything you can that snow fence, anything to keep them off your off your trees is um, definitely a, a step in the right direction. Hmm. Okay, so um, there is, uh, it's called sun scald. Yeah. So on smooth bark trees, it's usually smooth bark trees. A lot of times we'll see it on red maple, younger red maple. Um, but it's this time of year where the sun gets pretty warm and pretty hot during the day, um, but it's not actively growing. The ground is still frozen. Uh, we can see issues where it looks like the bark is cracking or we're having those those sort of issues. So. The trunk takes in all that heat, being a darker color, but it can't move any water through the roots since the ground is still frozen. So that's that's what you're looking at with sun scald, and it can actually it, it kind of cracks that bark open and can can cause another wound and be pretty stressful and damaging to trees. So occasionally we see it. I've never heard of of painting them white or putting putting anything on there like that, but I would I could see where it would work just to keep some of that heat off of there. Mm-hmm. Sure. So um, what we would do there, so he's got two maples in, in the yard that have kind of a double trunk. So it comes up and splits. Um, super common. What you can do is instead of taking off one whole side, if you can go up a little bit, what you're going to try to do is just you're going to try to subordinate one of them. So you've got two main leaders, what you can do is the one that's less healthy or smaller or maybe a, a little sh shorter, go in and start pruning smaller branches higher up on that one. What you're doing is you're lowering that energy that it has and you're, gonna, you're not going to shrink that one or do anything else, but you're lowering its input into the tree. So it's not going to grow as much as that leader that you choose to let go and, and, and be the true leader going forward. So start taking sparingly a couple of, of branches off as you prune. Start on that one trunk that you want to kind of quell. Um, do that over a few years and you should see the other one step up and and get up and really run on you. So is there another question back here? Um, hybrid trees like autumn blades that have been around long enough now, 20 years or more, and were very popular. Has, uh, have they survived long enough to know if they're really going to make it? Sure. So, yeah, autumn blaze, a lot of those, you know, we're not seeing issues in in the woods with them becoming invasive or anything like that. I don't think they're going to be necessarily reproducing on their own, but as a yard tree, they they do great. They, I, they, they've they definitely proven themselves to everybody. Um, I, 
I guess, what do you mean are they, are they going to make it? Well, I'm just wondering if uh, you talk about trees over 10, 20 years, you know, they do so well and they're so quick growing sure. and they have great shape. I just wonder if anything after these, these many years, if something has shown sure. itself to be a problem with these trees, okay. they work. That's yeah. About 30 years ago, <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, as for longevity, I've personally, that's, those are the trees that my dad's neglected in our front yard. Um, they're doing great. They, uh, no issue. I haven't heard of anything longevity wise that, that you're running into. Um, a lot of the issues with the native trees, the ones that are going to get up and grow super fast for you, they're also going to be the ones that, that fade away quicker. So when you get to 60, 70 years, so if you're planting aspen or birch or anything like that, um, silver maple, a lot, they grow very quickly, but one of the issues are they're, they're weak wooded, so you're going to lose a lot of branches. Um, and sometimes their, their life isn't as long as, as other ones that grow more slowly. So um, something to keep in mind, but yeah, autumn, autumn blaze and all those, I haven't heard anything. And yeah, for 30, the 30 years that we've had along, they're, they're still doing great and no issues that I know of. Sure. So, uh, trying to th lilacs, and I, knowing your background, do you have any lilacs? Any suggestions or anything like that? I don't deal with them too often. Uh, we grow mostly miniature uh, lilacs, okay. um, only because we can keep them under control. Sure. A lot better than uh, some of the ones that were on our property when we first. Okay. Um, Try it back. Yeah, Try it back. Yeah, I was, I was thinking that. I think lilacs do store a fair amount of energy in the roots. So if you're, yeah, I can't promise you, but if you prune it very heavily or even take it all the way back, you should see new shoots and new roots starting. So you're going to have a stump there, um, but you should see new shoots coming up, and you can try to work on that just with the energy and the, the nutrients stored underneath, you should see some regrowth coming. And again, that would take like that with the Correct. Yep. Um, I actually am employed with Johnson's Nursery. So in answer to that question, when you get an older lilac, if you haven't stayed on top of pruning it, you can do what's called a rejuvenation prune, which is essentially cutting it to the ground. Okay. It takes a couple of years for it to come back. Thank you. Yep. I miss my row of uh, sumac trees from my old yard. Can I plant one from seed or buy one and then put it in a large pot? Yeah. Um, sumac, you, you can keep it in a large pot. Um, it could get pot bound pretty quickly. They do grow very, very quickly. So that's one thing to keep, keep in mind. But um, yeah, you should be able to keep them going and, and holding on for a little while for you. Correct. No, yes, they, they do spread really quickly. So yeah, I, it should do pretty well in, in a pot. You just have to make sure it doesn't, it'll try to overgrow that pot like a goldfish in a bowl or something like that. But you should be able to keep a, a moderately sized one for a while. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes, so a question about ball and burlap. If you can, we'd recommend taking, yep, take all the wire off and take all that burlap off. It, it should break down, um, but sometimes it, I've dug up trees that are 10 years old and that burlap is still completely around it. You have a couple of, um, couple of roots that sneak through, but otherwise all those roots are still contained in that, in that burlap. So the more you... Yep. Yep. And and I'll be honest. When I worked the landscaping company, that we pull the wire back 
halfway down, we pull that burlap back halfway down, and we'd leave it on. Yep, it's supposed to rot and it's supposed to degrade away. Um, now all of the literature and all the stuff is they're saying take it completely off. So I I can't tell you how many I've planted with with the burlap and the wire on, um, but everything that we're reading and as we dig some of these out that didn't make it, that is all burlap and the wire is all still there almost completely. So yeah, 20 years ago, 10 years ago we were taught to leave it all on. Um, now they're saying to remove it all. Mm-hmm. So, uh, question is bare root versus potted trees. Uh, on the forestry side of things, I, I love bare root trees because you can buy a whole mess of them for next to nothing compared to a, a one inch caliber bald and burlap or potted tree. So, um, I like them in, in that regard just for the cost savings. I think again, if you, you're gonna plant them very similar, um, for the amount you save and each, I, I'm a fan of them. So it takes a little bit more work as they're younger. Um, you might need to use that tree tube or things like that, but you're, you're starting a tree very young and spends his whole life in that spot. You don't have the transplant shock of taking a larger tree out where it takes more time to get um, established in that new soil. So I would, I recommend, and if, if you have the means to get bare root stock, I would do it and instead of planting one, maybe you plant three, and you, you work that way. I. And then along the same line, uh, buying a tree with a smaller diameter versus a larger diameter. Yep. Yeah. So, again, I would, I err on the side of smaller, um, just because they're easier to handle. They're less transplant shock. Um, for every inch in diameter or caliber that you have, it takes. A lot longer for that tree to acclimate to actually put on growth in your yard. I don't remember if it's two years per inch or whatever it might be, but it's got, you, you think of a, a two inch tree, those roots naturally are going to be 10 feet out. Um, and now what they're doing is they're taking it and putting it in a ball the size of a five gallon pail. So the smaller tree you have, the more that root system's intact, and the faster it can start putting energy into the roots and growing not only the root system, but also vertically, which you're gonna see above ground. So you're, the smaller the tree that you get, the more of the root system, and that's kind of a benefit into the future as it starts to take off and grow. So wet areas, it depends how wet. So um, if you're talking almost standing water, uh, black spruce do really well. Um, uh, Again, going to be a conifer. Um, otherwise, hackberry do pretty well in, in wetter spots. Red maple or silver maple do very well. Um, as, as you get wet, silver maple will actually take standing water for um, a decent amount of time. Sycamore, uh, we're using more sycamore on all of our DNR properties just because that can, that can withstand being underwater sometimes for a month or two at a time. We're on the extreme northern border of where sycamore is historically been, um, but since our winters haven't been that tough, we're not seeing any issues yet. We'll see how they all did this winter, um, but we haven't been seeing any issues with, with freezing out or anything like that. So sycamore is kind of something different, but it's, it's something that has proven us really well on a forestry setting in the last few years. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably good for now. Sure, yep. I think everybody is ready to take a break sure. here and get going but thank you so much mark for coming and we hope you guys all enjoy and we hope you come to our next